All right, please open your Bibles to 2 Samuel. Tonight we're going to start this new book. We've gone through 1 Samuel together. 1 Samuel pretty much dealt with, uh, you know, David's very humble beginnings. Uh, it dealt with Saul and, and his kingship and his kingdom and many of the, the, the difficulties that David had uh, with Saul, uh, who we learned was his father-in-law, um, as we went through here. And uh, when we wrapped this up last week, we had seen that there had been a battle and that Saul and his sons were killed in the battle. And we read about what they did to Saul's body. And um, so as we move into this, the beginning of this, and just for your common information, you remember Samuel died as we were teaching 1 Samuel. So if Samuel's dead, it's pretty unlikely that he wrote 2 Samuel, Right? Because he's dead. So the question is, who wrote these books? You ever wonder about that? Um, so do a little research, looking around a little bit, I learned that Nathan and Gad were the scribes and the prophets that served David. And it's thought that they're the ones that wrote First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. That they're the ones that uh, recorded all of it and wrote it down. Um, in early times, First and Second Samuel were one book, and First and Second Kings were one book, and they were all combined together, and they were called the four books of the kings. So it wasn't until um, the 16th century that they became First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, the way we have it today. So it was a lot different back then. Um, the way it was written, the way it was recorded. So I wanted to share that with you. I thought it was pretty interesting as I learned that on my little study time. So let's go ahead and we're going to read a little bit here. And, uh, you know, sometimes when we get reading in the Old Testament, things can get really monotonous, especially when you start into the begats. You know, Bob begat Bill and Bill begat Dave, and it just kind of keeps on going, and pretty soon you're snoring, and, you know. Um, so when we encounter things like that, we will find ourselves cruising through it very quickly, you know, so we don't have to dwell on, on the mundane stuff for too long. So let's start in verse 1, 2 Samuel. Now it came to pass after the death of Saul, when David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had stayed two days in Ziglag. And on the third day, behold, it happened that a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. And so it was when he came to David that he fell to the ground and he prostrated himself. David said to him, where have you come from? So he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. And then David said to him, well, how did the matter go? Please tell me. And he answered, the people have fled from the battle. Many of the people are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his sons, his son, are dead also. So David said to the young man who told him, how do you know that Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead? And then the young man who told him, said, Well, as I happened by chance to be on Mount Gilboa, there was Saul leaning on his spear. And indeed, the chariots and the horsemen were following hard after him. Now, when I looked behind him, he saw me and he called to me. And I answered, Here I am. And he said to me, Who are you? And he answered him, I'm an Amalekite. He said to me again, Please stand over me and kill me, for anguish has come upon me, but my life still remains in me. So I stood over him, and I killed him, because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head, and the bracelet that was on his arm, and I have brought them here to my Lord. 
So this is the introduction to this book, but there is an issue here, if you remember. In 1 Samuel, when the book ended, we saw David, or Saul and Jonathan's death. And it wasn't just Saul and Jonathan, it was all of his sons, except for one. They all died in this battle, and the account of that death is different than the account that we have in 2 Samuel. So a lot of people have grabbed a hold of that and said, See, you really can't trust what the Bible says, because it's contradicting itself within two pages. Well, at first glance, you might look at that and you might say, Yeah, this is a totally different uh, chain of events taking place than what the end of 1 Samuel told us. The end of 1 Samuel told us that Saul committed suicide. That he leaned on his spear and he died. And now we have this guy come along and he's coming to David. Why is he coming to David? Well, because he knows that Saul and David have been going at it for years. He knows that David's going to be the one in power. And he wants to ingratiate himself to David. He wants to get brownie points, if you will. So he's thinking, if I go and tell this tale to David, he's going to, he's going to like me because of the fact that uh, I killed his enemy. So which story is true? Well, I think it's very likely as we look at this that both of them are true. It's very likely that David did lean on his spear to commit suicide. And Jonathan was dead. And, and the account of, of uh, 1 Samuel tells it a little bit differently. But here comes this guy. And notice his words that he says to David. By chance, I just happened upon Saul. Like I was just taking a stroll across the hill there and there was Saul laying there. And he asked me to kill him because he wasn't dead yet. Well, perhaps he was still alive. And if this guy's being honest with David, then Saul had not died yet. And as this Amalekite came along... Now, one of the big things with Saul was he asked one of his um, soldiers to finish him off. Finish me off. Well, the soldier wouldn't do it. So that's why he fell on his spear. And when he fell on his spear, his servant, the soldier, he committed suicide. So they're both laying there. And it would appear that perhaps Saul was not dead at that time. And so here comes this Amalekite. Well, Saul said, kill me to his soldier in 1 Samuel because I don't want the Amalekites and the Philistines to get a hold of my body. Because you know what the enemy would do with bodies that they would get a hold of, of kings? And they would mutilate them. They would cut them up. They would do horrible things to them. And Saul did not want his life to end by the heathens doing that to him. So he figured it'd be better to just kill myself. Um, evidently, perhaps, he wasn't dead. And here comes this fellow who tells us that he finished him off and he took his crown and the bracelets that were on him and the things that were important that showed who he was. And he's thinking, boy, I'm going to go see David. He's going to think I'm the greatest guy in the world. So therefore, in verse 11, David took hold of his own clothes and tore them. That was something that they did in ancient times when something terrible would happen. They would tear their clothes. Kind of a strange thing. And they would throw dust on themselves. And, that was the, and they would be crying and wailing. And that was the way they mourned. And so David took hold of his own clothing and he tore it. And so did all the men that were with him. And they mourned and they wept. And they fasted until the evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son. For the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel. Because they had fallen by the sword. So David said to the young man who told him, where are you from? And he answered, he said, I'm the son of an alien. Now, not an outer space alien, somebody who wasn't a Jew, an Amalekite. Now, do you remember what we talked about with these Amalekites? They continue to be a, sore, a thorn in the side of Israel. They, when Israel left Egypt... Um, it's believed that Amalek, who was the father of the Amalekites, 
took his people and attacked the Jews from behind. He came up on the, uh, the, the end of the procession, if you will, where the old men and the women and the children would be in, in, the, in the hike, if you will. They'd have the armies in the front, and, and as, it, it, as it would go along, you know, they had the, the crippled, and they were pushing them in wagons or whatever. And so these Amalek, Amalek takes his army and attacks Israel, dirty, rotten scoundrel, from behind. Hundreds of years have gone by, and Amalek, his children, his descendants, are still on the warpath against Israel. Now, you might remember in 1 Samuel, we talked about this a little bit, and Samuel the prophet told Saul, go down to the Amalekites and wipe them out. Totally wipe them out. And we discovered that the Amalekites were a type of the flesh. They were a type of sin, if you will. And we as believers, it's very important that when God says, wipe them out, that we wipe it all out. Because if we let it linger, if we let any of our sinful ways survive, you know, it comes back to haunt us. So here we are, way down the road now, and these Amalekites are still at it. Because Saul did not do what God told him to do. David's killed a lot of them, but there must be a ton of them. So David's asking this guy, where are you, you, know, where are you from? And in verse 14, David says to him, How was it that you were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? So do you know how many times David had a chance to kill Saul? Several times, didn't he? He snuck up on him a few times. He had an opportunity to take him out. His men were encouraging him to, to take him out. This is victory. God's given you victory. And David saw that and said, no, that's not, that's not God's will. This is God's anointed. He may be rotten to the core, but this is the one that the, the crown is on. He's the one that holds the power and the authority, and I will not touch him. If God wants him, God will take him. It's not going to be by my hand. So now we got this little Amalekite showing up who is an enemy. He represents sin and evil. And he's telling David, I killed Saul. I want a reward probably or whatever, right? So David asks him, weren't you afraid? Didn't you understand how the gravity of what you were doing? That you killed the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men in verse 15. And he said, go near and execute him. And he struck him so that he died. So this fellow that shows up at David's doorstep for his troubles, <laughs> he gets executed for killing the king, allegedly. So David said to him, your blood is on your own head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. And David lamented with his lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. And he told them to teach the children of Judah the song of the bow. And indeed, it is written in the book of Jasher. The book of Jasher was lost. There's no copies of it in existence. We don't know what happened to it. Um, but uh, it, has a lot of, it had a lot of important facts in it that, that we find, actually, as we go through some of these books of the kings. Some of these other books are mentioned that we don't really have in existence anymore. And this is the lament. This is the, the grieving. This is the... David expressing his pain because Saul is dead. How would you feel if it's a guy's been chasing you around in the hillside for years, many years now, and finally he's dead? You'd think David would be doing a dance and rejoicing, right? But he's not. He's grieving. He understands something about authority. You know, every single one of us is called by the Lord for some reason or another, for some purpose, whatever it might be. And you probably know 
what God's called you for and your purpose. But we're very imperfect. And we make a lot of mistakes. And I think if we were to be put on the scale, if you will, none of us would be good enough to serve the Lord. None of us would be good enough to have the anointing of God in our lives. It's by His grace that we have it. And even though Saul was, you know, a double-minded man, he was insecure, he was a psycho, basically, but he was the Lord's anointed with all of his faults. He became the king, and God used Saul to bring about his purposes in this young nation. He does the same thing today. When we look around and we see some of the corruption, and we see some of the evil things that are going on with leaders. And we think, how did they ever, how did God ever allow that? Well, you can be assured of one thing. God is in control of it. And every single one of them is a little pawn on God's chessboard. And he knows exactly what he's doing. It tells us in the Bible that he sets up kings and he tears them down. He sets up kingdoms and he tears them down. And he does that in the end. And we will all say this together one day. He does it to accomplish his will and his plan in our lives. It may seem weird. It may seem not right. It may seem the, uh, sh how could Herod go out and kill all the children that were two years old and younger when Jesus was born? How in the world could God ever use that in his plan? I don't know. But I do know this, that God's plan is being worked out by every event that's taken place in all of history. Because he's the mighty God. He's the almighty God. So this lament, this grieving speech that David's going to give. <clears throat> I'll read down through it. It says, The beauty of Israel is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. And let the daughters of the Philistines, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. In other words, let's not put this on social media. We don't want the Philistines knowing what happened, because they'll be doing a dance because Saul has been destroyed and his army was destroyed. You remember Gath? Who came from Gath? Who, who, who's the scoundrel that came from Gath? Goliath. That's right. That was where Goliath's hometown was. Verse 21, O mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor field of offerings, for the shield of the mighty is cast away there. The shield of Saul, not anointed with oil, it was defiled, that's what he's trying to say. And from the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, and the sword of Saul did not return empty. Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles and stronger than lions. O oh, daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places." I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war have perished. You know, David's son, Solomon, wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. I don't know if you guys have ever read that book or not. It's a book of complaint, basically. It's a book of uh, the awareness and the understanding that all is empty. No matter what you do, no matter what you accomplish, no matter how rich you are, no matter how famous you are, it's all empty. It's not new. Someone has already done it before you. And, and Solomon, that was the quest of his life, to try to do something in this world that was original. 
but there's nothing new, he said, under the sun. Well, what we're seeing here with David reminds me of the mindset that David had during this moment. The mighty have fallen and their weapons of war have perished. There was a time when Saul was the most powerful man in that whole area there. He had all the weapons of war. He had all the great warriors. And now look, he has nothing. Isn't that kind of how life is, isn't it? You know, we invest so much into the things that are just going to turn to dust. They're not important in the end. They're not really worthy of that kind of attention and affection. And so we as Christians, as we're growing spiritually in the Lord, we start learning in our lives what really is valuable and what really is important and what, you know, we're investing ourselves in something, right? You can invest yourselves in your career or your family or be an athlete or invest yourself in whatever. It all comes to an end. So we're learning we invest ourselves in the things of the kingdom of God, in eternal things. You remember what Jesus said about that, right? Don't lay up treasures on the earth. Don't get all caught up on that. Work on your treasures in heaven. They're eternal. They'll be there forever. You'll never lose them. They'll never turn to dust. Moths won't get into them. And I think David is beginning. Now, Jonathan, they've accused him of being a homosexual. Because there's several times within 1 Samuel and here in 2 Samuel that the words that are used concerning Jonathan and David's relationship, um, people have grabbed a hold of that and twisted it and perverted it to try to say, oh, see, David was gay. Him and Jonathan were partners because of verses like this. Nothing can be further from the truth. Okay. These two men had a kinship with one another. They were a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You remember reading that in the New Testament. Our relationships with one another can become so binding that they can really become more important than maybe some of our relationships with our family. You all know how easy it is for family to begin to drift apart, to begin to take political stances and cause division because of that. And you're not welcome in my home anymore. I'll never be coming here for Thanksgiving again because you're one of those wacko conservative weirdos or you're one of those liberal crazy people and you're no longer my family. But we're different. The whole idea behind being a family that's what we are, a family of brothers and sisters, that we can build relationships that will outlast our own blood, our own kin. And that's why Jesus said that. There's a, there's a, there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Brothers will betray brothers. He said that that would happen, and it happens all the time. We're a different kind of a family. We have, we have a different standard that we live by. And it's forgiveness and grace. You ever come upon somebody that just rubs you the wrong way? You try really, really hard. You want to be gracious and nice to them, but every time you're around them, you can't wait to get away from them. You ever had somebody like that? They're like the sand in an oyster. It's very irritating. But you know, that's how a pearl is formed. Because of that irritating sand in the sensitive parts, a pearl is formed. And when we become family like that, there's no, I could never do this to any of you or anybody for that matter. Because I'm just as unworthy as anybody else. That's why Jesus said, don't judge one another. You don't have the authority or even the common sense to condemn somebody. Because you're condemned yourself without the blood of Jesus. 
So we have a different standard than the world does. And we live with one another. We rub each other the wrong way. We get our little feelings hurt sometimes. You know, I was in that church all morning long and the pastor didn't even look at me. I'm never coming back here again. And believe me, it's the little teeny tiny itsy bitsy things that create. It's the little sand grains. It's the things that seem insignificant that create that type of vibe, if you will. But you know what? We've learned better. We've learned that we're all sinners saved by grace. And we're all to love one another with God's love. And that's an unconditional love. Are there wolves that come amongst us? Absolutely. But God deals with them. God handles it. You know, we've had a few come through here. And he tends to send them down the way. And we just keep on doing what we do. Awesome. Beautiful. So let's take a look at chapter 2. It happened after this that David inquired of the Lord saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. David said, Where shall I go up? Give me a little bit more specifics here, Lord. He said, Go to Hebron. So David went up there. Now you notice, he's talking about going up. Hebron was on a hill. It was on the top of a large mound, if you will. And you could see 360 degrees all around it. Very defensive, defensible uh, city. Many of the ancient cities, if you look at them, you'll find that they were built on a hill. Very seldom were they in a valley where they could be, you know, attacked and vulnerable. So David went up there. You know, you read about... Uh, talking about the, the Jews, talking about going to Jerusalem. No matter where they're at in the country, north, south, east, or west, it doesn't matter where they're at. The phrase is always, let's go up to Jerusalem. We're going up to the mountain of God, right? You never go down to Jerusalem. So where should I go? He says, go to Hebron. So David went there. And his two wives also. Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David brought up the men who were with him, remember the 600 guys that he's got, and every man with his household. And so they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. And then the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David, the king, over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, The men of Jabesh Gilead are the ones who buried Saul. So David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead, said to them, You are blessed of the Lord, for you have shown kindness to your Lord, to Saul, and you have buried him. They had respect for the king. Now, we learned earlier that he was burnt after he died. They burned him. Very, very, un that was not the practice of, the, of God's people. Um, that was more the practice of um, ungodly nations. God, nations that worshipped other gods, they used to burn their dead a lot. It, the Israelites didn't do that. They buried them, put them in tombs, whatever. But it's maybe thought that Saul's body was so mangled, so abused, that he was unrecognizable, and so they chose to burn him. But evidently, they didn't burn his bones. So they collected his bones, and they went and they buried them, showing respect to the king. And David is recognizing that here in this verse. You've shown kindness to your Lord and to Saul, and have buried him. And now may the Lord show kindness and truth to you, I also will repay you this kindness, because you have done this thing. Now, therefore, let your hands be strengthened and be valiant, for your master Saul is dead. And also, the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. What's missing here? David's the king 
over what? Over the house of Judah. That's only two tribes. There's ten more tribes. We call them Israel. So you got two houses. You got the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So what's going on up in Israel? Because David was told he was going to be the king over the whole thing. And what we find out is going on here that Saul had a son that survived. Verse 8 says, But Abner, who was the commander of Saul's army, the son of Ner, well, it says the commander of Saul's army, took Ishshobeth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahaniam. And he made him king over Gilead, and over the Asherites, and Jezreel, and Ephraim, and Benjamin, and over all of Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel. And he reigned for two years. And only the house of Judah followed David. So we have a split kingdom here. We have two, kingdom, two kings ruling literally in one kingdom. So Abner, the son of Nar, and the servants of Ishbosheth, that's a hard one, the son of Saul, went out from Mahaniam to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, blah, 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 and the servants of David, went out and met them by the pool of Gibeon. This is very strange. So they sat down. So you got the leaders of Israel meeting with the leaders of Judah, and they get to this little pond, um, and the one group sits on one side of the pond, and the other group sits on the other side pool. It's called the pool, so probably very small. And Abner said to Joab, these are the two commanders, let the young men now arise and compete before us. And Joab agreed. He said, well, then let them arise. And so they arose and they went over by number, 12 from Benjamin, followers of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and 12 from the servants of David. And each one grasped his, grasped his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side. So they fell down together. Therefore, that place was called the Field of Sharp Swords, which is in Gideon. So there was a very fierce battle that day. And Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. So this is kind of like, a, let's take a few of your best guys and let's let them go at it. And whoever wins will be the, the victor. Whoever wins will have the power. Why go out and have 50,000 men slaughtered when we can take care of it here with just 24 guys? Kind of weird thinking, huh? So Abner, he lost. And his guys lost. The, 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 the people from Israel lost. The people from Judah uh, were victorious. Now the three sons of Zeruiah were there, Joab and Abishai and Ahaziel. And Ahaziel was as fleet of foot as a wild gazelle. Evidently this dude could run. He could run really, really fast. So after this showdown had happened, Abner's trying to get away and this fellow, Ashiel, pursues Abner. And in going, he did not turn right to the right hand or to the left from following Abner. He's going to get him. He's going to take him out. Abner looked behind him and said, Are you Ashiel? And he answered, I am. You can imagine this happening while he's running along. Yeah, that's who I am, right? I'm coming after you. Abner said, Turn aside to your right hand or to your left and lay hold on one of the young men and take his armor for yourself. But Asiel, he would not turn aside from following him. So Abner said again to Asiel, Turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I face your brother, Joab, who was the commander of David's group? However, he refused to turn aside. Therefore, Abner struck him in the stomach with the blunt end of his spear, so that the spear came out of his back, and he fell down there, and he died on the spot. 
And so it was that as many as came to the place where Asahel fell down and died, they stood still. So all these guys are in pursuit, and they see this young man dead on the ground. They know it's the brother of the commander of the army, and it stops them in their tracks. Now Joab and Abishai also pursued Abner. And the sun was going down after they came to the hill of Ammah, which is before Gia, by the road to the wilderness of Gibeon. It'd be interesting to know where all these places are, huh? You know, it'd be nice to kind of have a map or something that we could, like, pinpoint all these. But these, a lot of these places, if you look on your Bible maps, you won't even find them written down there anywhere. They're very ancient, and most of them disappeared, and they're lost to, lost to history. They were never really, didn't make their mark, so to speak. So the children, <clears throat> so uh, where are we at here? Oh, verse 25. So the children of Benjamin gathered together behind Abner, and they became a unit. And they took their stand on the top of a hill. And then Abner, Abner called to Joab, and he said, Shall the sword devour forever? Do you not know that it will be bitter in the latter end? How long will it be then until you tell the people to return from pursuing their brother? And Joab said, As God lives, unless you had spoken, surely then by morning all the people would have given up pursuing their brethren. So Joab blew a trumpet, and all the people stood still and did not pursue Israel any more nor did they fight any more. And then Abner and his men went all that night through the plain, crossed over Jordan, and went all through all Bethron. And they came to Mahaniam. So Joab returned from pursuing Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, there were missing of David's servants, 19 men, and Asio. But the servants of David had struck down of Benjamin, Abner's men, 360 men who died. And then they took up Asiel and buried him in his father's tomb, which was in Bethlehem. And Joab and his men went all night, and they came to Hebron at daybreak. So this showdown that was going to take place, and Abner, he's the one with the common sense. He's the one that says to Joab, hey, man. How long are we going to do this? We're blood. We're family. And here we are. We're brethren and we're turning on each other. We're killing each other. How can this ever have a good outcome? It's a waste of life and energy. And, you know, uh, how long are we going to do this? So Joab, he, he realized, he said, you know, you're right. We need to stop right now. Probably one of the most sensible things that we'll read about um, as we go through this book. That they came to their senses and they decided, hey, it's not worth it. How's our time looking? Oh, not much. <clears throat> so we kind of reach a, uh, a fork in the road here. And we picked this up in chapter 3, and we're not going to get through this chapter tonight because it's kind of long, and uh, it's really long. <laughs> but uh, we'll pick it up wherever we park tonight. We'll just get in and start driving next week. So now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. So remember, the house of Saul is the ten tribes, Israel. The house of David is two tribes called Judah. That's where the Messiah came. He was the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now we're going to get a little bit of a... <laughs> this will kind of blow your mind. So this long war is going on, but David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. And sons were born to David in Hebron. His firstborn was named Ammon by Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess. His second son was Chiliab by Abigail, the widow of Nabal the Carmelite. The third son was Absalom, the son of Maaka, the daughter of Talmi, the king of Geshur. This guy's got a problem. 
The fourth son is Adonijah, and he's the son of Haggith. The fifth son was Stephatiah, and he was the son of Abital. The sixth one, <laughs> Ithrium, by David's wife Iglah, were born to David in Hebron. <laughs> and so it was, while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner was strengthening his hold on the house of Saul. And Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah. So Isbosheth, remember Isbosheth is the king of Israel. He's Saul's only surviving son. And uh, he says, why? So <laughs> uh, Saul's concubine, you know what a concubine is, I'm assuming, adults, right? Um, he had a concubine and her name was Rizpah. Now, Isbosheth is the king. Well, before we go too far, I just want to point out something very interesting here. Every one of the sons that David had came from a different mother. All of them came from a different mother. And that did not work out very good for David. As a matter of fact, two of his sons would totally betray him and try to overthrow his kingdom down the road. We'll see that as we go through the book. David wasn't a very good parent. He wasn't a very good example. As a matter of fact, he was an example of everything not to do. Right? And he pays for it in the end. And again, we look at this and we think, wait a minute, seven women with seven different kids from seven different women? Some of them were his wives. Maybe some of them were just, I don't know, girls who hung out. This guy's being fruitful and multiplying, right? But that's not the way God wants it to be. Now, if you were to ask the LDS today, they would tell you, no, God wants me to have 15 wives or more. Matter of fact, they got their own TV show on TV these days. Right? And you know what? 99% of the time, those relationships don't work out. There's jealousy, there's envy, there's strife, there's all kinds of things going on. We saw the same thing with Sarah. When her servant girl had the child, the, um, her husband went into Hagar and got her pregnant and give birth to a son, which is all that Abraham ever wanted. And then what happens? A few years later, Sarah gets pregnant. They didn't get along too good. Sarah winds up driving the woman with her son out. You can read about it in Hebrews. So these multi-relationship things, they don't work. God set it up for you and I to be married to one person. Right? Now, some of you are sitting there going, wait a minute, I've been married twice. Yeah, but not at the same time. <laughs> right? We won't go too far into that one. I'm just glad we're all saved by grace, aren't you? <laughs> Amen. So this concubine that Paul, uh, Saul had, um, Abner wants her. But because it was Saul's concubine, his son... Ishbosheth should have every right in the world to have this concubine for himself. Because he's sitting on the throne, and it was kind of a, a benefit of royalty to have these concubines. Solomon had, what, 300 of them? He probably never even saw most of them during his life, you know. But Abner, what Abner's doing here is doing exactly the same thing that Saul did. He's usurping authority. He did not have the authority to take this woman. He's disrespecting Ishbosheth, and, and so he's asking Abner, why have you gone into my father's concubine? You've disrespected me, my father, and the throne. And Abner became very angry at his words, the words of Ishbosheth, and said, Am I a dog's head that belongs to Judah? Today I show loyalty to the house of Saul, your father, and to his brothers and his friends, and have not delivered you into the hand of David, and you charge me today with a fault concerning this woman? In other words, after all I've done to you? See, I think Ishbosheth was just a figurehead. I think really behind the scenes it was Abner's goal. 
he was the one that wanted to be in charge. And by doing this, that was one of a, almost like a coup, in a way, taking over authority. So verse 9, May God do so to Abner, and more also, if I do not do for David, as the Lord has sworn to him. So transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul, and set up the throne of David over Israel and Judah, from Dan to Beersheba. And he could not answer Abner another word, because he feared him. So now we're seeing Ishbosheth's power going away. And Abner's saying, hey, you need to give it all to David. You need to give it to him from Dan to Beersheba. From all the way to the most northern parts of Israel, all the way to the most southern parts of Israel, you need to give it to David and let him reign over Judah and over Israel. Now, this king, the son of Saul, now is intimidated. He's afraid. He doesn't quite know what to do. So there's a lot of intrigue. There's a lot of betrayal. There's a lot of evil intentions going on. And it doesn't get any better. We're going to see that as we go forward. So how is it that... We'll stop right there. How is it that these people can be so messed up, but here they are in the Bible? What I mean, you know, if I wasn't a knowledgeable person of the Bible, I would sit back and go, there wouldn't be any evil people in the Bible. If you're in the Bible, you must be pretty good. But you know what I like about the Bible? It tells the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? It's very upfront, very honest. As we see our reflection in these people's lives, we see some of the tendencies that we might have, maybe on a smaller scale, but much like these men. We begin to understand how important it is that Jesus came. To set us free from the bondage that we were in to sin. You see, in the New Testament, Paul tells us that it was like we were, we were at a slave market. And, and we were for sale to the highest bidder. And Jesus came and paid the price and he purchased us from the slave market. And he made us sons and daughters of God. Beautiful thing. Nothing that I've done or you've done has made us worthy uh, to stand in that position. But yet here we are. So let's go ahead and pray and we'll close it out for the night. Father, we want to thank you tonight for our prayer time, for the meal. And bless those, Lord, that served us this evening. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, that, that we can look at these stories and we can come to understand that you're a very, very patient God. And that you have everything under control. And Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, to learn from these things. So that we might walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. So that we might make good decisions, Lord, to serve you. And not to turn back. To keep our eyes fixed upon the prize. That we might spend eternity with you, Lord. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Nope.